So next up, we're going to look at operons in bacteria, notably the LAC and TERP operons. So an operon is a group of genes that are co-regulated and they're involved in the same biological processes. There are a whole bunch of genes just stacked together on DNA. Okay, and prokaryotes have these and then not only are those genes real close together, but they actually get transcribed together in a long polycystronic messenger RNA. And the two key ones we're going to look at are the LAC operon, which is um, how bacteria will digest lactose that's present in the environment, and the TRIP operon, the tryptophan biosynthesis operon. So the, here's the tryptophan biosynthesis operon, or the TRIP operon in E. coli. So all these genes are under the control of one promoter. Okay. The genes that are encoding these enzymes for tryptophan biosynthesis are located immediately next to each other. So that means they're going to get transcribed all together, all in the same direction. And when this happens, a big, long mRNA is made called a polycystronic mRNA. Now it's got multiple um, stop codons. Okay, so when the ribosomes latch on, depending where they start, they're going to make one of the five different um, enzymes there. Uh, and then those peptides for this particular same process are all made in the same level at the same location at the same time. It's a very handy uh, evolutionarily beneficial system here. Okay, so um, these mutants that say if one of these um, genes has a mutation, like a nonsense mutation or something, then you lose this pathway, okay? And so if you lost this pathway, you're called an oxytroph. Meanwhile, there's uh, the wild type are called prototrophs. So we're actually gonna look a lot at the, um, what does it take to lose your uh, ability to synthesize these? So the key regulator in this particular operon, there's I think four different ways this, this operon is regulated, but the key one is tryptophan itself regulating the transcription of the operon, okay? So when tryptophan is present, you don't need a whole lot of it. It's the least um, common of the amino acids. You only need a tiny bit. So once it gets present enough here to find its way back to this DNA, um, it will prevent the, the um, transcription of this mRNA, okay? So when tryptophan is present, it's going to kind of, this is like feedback inhibition. It's going to, the, the final end product is going to prevent uh, you starting the whole process again. However, when tryptophan is absent, okay, the operons then transcribed and the enzymes are made and you can make more tryptophan, which it will then switch back to the, okay, now we're going to repress the production of this stuff because we have tryptophan. We don't need any more to make any more. Okay. So how does the presence of tryptophan itself regulate the transcription of this operon? Okay. Well, first let's look at this little blue piece here, this operator. Okay. This operator is a genetic sequence. It allows proteins responsible for transcription to attach to the DNA sequence. It's usually uh, where repressor binds to stop transcription. Okay. So in the TERP operon, the operator is within the promoter, but in other operons, it can be other places. Okay. Operator can lie between the promoter and the coding region in that like untranslated area. So aside from the operon, we have another gene at play in the system, this TERP R. Okay. The tryptophan repressor gene, which codes for this repressor. Okay. And when tryptophan is absent, we're fine. Tryptophan is absent, RNA polymerase can bind and transcribe that operon, and we're good to go. Okay. Uh, so the trip repressor can't bind on its own, doesn't block transcription. However, when tryptophan is present, tryptophan will bind the repressor and change its conformation so that it can now bind to the operator. And when the tryptophan repressor is bound to the operator, then RNA polymerase cannot latch onto the promoter. This blocks it, okay? Because in this case, the operator is within the promoter. And so um, tryptophan is here is acting as a co-repressor along with the regular repressor. And then that complex, once those two are both present, can bind to the operator and block transcription. Okay. So a repressor protein turns off or inhibits transcription, okay? And then that um, sort of complex binds the operator sequence. 
So mutations here can get really interesting. Okay. This is where when we know the system well enough, we can go in and ask like, hey, well, what happens if? And so in this case, the first one is what happens if uh, there's a mutation and the repressor is never made? Okay. In that case, we can say, well, if the repressor is never made, it's never going to be able to bond with tryptophan and block. It can't block RNA polymerase anymore. So the phenotype here is now we have tryptophan always being produced, okay, which is a drain on a cell's metabolism. Okay, It doesn't have enough time or energy to do anything else. Okay. So if we have a TERP-R mutation, that's not actually within the TERP operon. That's in that separate um, gene for the repressor. Second mutation, if we've got a mutation, the TERP-E, okay, uh, say something like yoink, right here, we get everything works as prime, but we've got um, TERP-E, we are missing that one particular enzyme there, and now remember bacteria tend to just have the one chromosome, they don't have a lot of extra copies floating around, so if you knock out your TERP-E gene here, uh, tryptophan can't be made because you've uh, lost your first piece of the biosynthesis pathway. And then the third option here, oh yeah, the TERP E map is within the operon. And then the third is um, we've got the uh, uh, mutation in the operator, okay? So there's our little handy operator. And if there's a mutation in that, well then the repressor can't bind, okay? You, uh, the, the operator is different than that particular site-specific thing the um, repressor is looking for, can't bind, and again you have an issue where the tryptophan is always made. We could look into other um, types of mutations, but these are sort of the three main ones that could happen. I might ask you about those. These sound like great, great test questions. Yeah. Operator mutations mean that the repressor can no longer bind. Okay, so our first uh, method of regulation was through the repressor. The second is something called attenuation. Okay, attenuation, you're reducing the effect of something. In this case, this attenuation is taking place at the leader sequence, trip L, okay, between the promoter and trip E. And so this happens to the trip opterons transcript as ribosomes are attempting to translate it. There's actually two ribosomes going on here, okay. Uh, this transcript, okay, can form what's called intrastrand base pairs, also called RNA hairpins, these like little loops here, okay. So the key thing is, is as one ribosome is going along and translating things, it'll run into this region where you've got these tryptophan residues, where you would need tryptophan in order to to build it, okay. If there is tryptophan, it goes through and it keeps going and eventually it gets, um, these guys stick and oops over here now that these two now that region one and two are sticking region three and four then stick and everything gets blocked okay um, the other confirmation is as your ribosome is happily going along it stalls out here where there aren't you don't have any tryptophan available so it just sits here but what that does is this ribosome sitting here prevents the one and two regions from pairing up and now regions two and three pair up instead, which means the second ribosome can grab onto region four here and start producing and continue translating the rest of that. I'll do it over again in the next slide. Okay, so here's the two uh, varieties here. If tryptophan is present, attenuation occurs, okay, da, 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 the trip codons are translated, um, the ribosome pauses, uh, and then there's this blockage at region three and four, okay, and then this ribosome can't work, okay, but if tryptophan is absent, we don't get any attenuation, this ribosome stalls, which allows regions two and three to pair up, and then region four is now open for the second ribosome coming along to translate the rest of this um, script, okay. So we've got multiple points of regulation going on in this. Uh, it's not just one. The first one being the repressor protein, the second one being attenuation, where we had the RNA hairpins blocking ribosomes. There's an internal promoter between trip D and trip C, which can um, increase the production of those last three genes at times, uh, more of those that are further along in the pathway. And then finally, we have feedback inhibition, which I mentioned earlier, where um, the tryptophan, the end product, actually binds to a subunit of this enzyme here. So once this is made into a little enzyme, 
uh, tryptophan will bind to it okay and grab on and prevent it from actually doing much of anything so that's slowing down the, the this would be post translational um, change here where the tryptophan is slowing down the um, rate that this enzyme can work and that will also help prevent too much tryptophan from being synthesized. So the next thing we're looking at uh, has to do with bacterial growth. Okay, So we're going to look at this is a growth curve here. Hopefully this is somewhat um, uh, something you've seen before. So we first start out, there's a lag phase where the cells are not dividing. They're just sitting in their new nutrient bath going, okay. And then they start using all that delicious uh, media and they start growing what we call log phase or an exponential phase where they're doubling every generation or so. Eventually they stop, usually because they're running out of resources and they enter the stationary phase where we do have cells dividing and cells dying, but it's at roughly the same rate. And then finally you enter the death phase where you have more death than you have cell division. Okay. That's usually when your resources are exhausted. Okay. So in the first part of the curve is when nutrients are plentiful and the second part is when the nutrients have been exhausted. Okay. So we can also see what's called a dioxic growth curve, die for two. Okay. When you have two different sugars present, you'll see that they're going to use up one sugar first before they start using the next one. Okay. So you get that log phase as it's using the first sugar, whichever the preferred sugar is. There's a bit of a lag phase because the bacteria is to start up a different system in order to process the second sugar. Then you have your log phase for the second one with that less preferred or harder to use sugar being used. And then finally you get to that stationary phase at the end and eventually you would see the cell death. So this is what's happening uh, when E. coli is using glucose and lactose as its two sugars. Glucose is simple, it's easier, it's preferred. Lactose is a disaccharide, okay, so it has to be cleaved in order to be used, and so it's less. So here's our good old lac operon, okay. In the DNA, we've got our promoter, okay, including inside the promoter is uh, a cap binding site, which we'll talk about after, later. And then between the promoter and the structural genes, we have the operator, okay. And then we have the uh, lac Z, lac Y, and lac A that are the genes that are coding for like lactose breakdown and digestion that are right next to each other on the genome. Okay. So again, one long transcript is made and there's three stop codons, one for each gene. So you get separate polypeptides made from the same transcript. And then you get your proteins, the beta-galactosidase, the beta-galactose permease, and then the breakdown protein. Okay. So here they are again. We've got the LAC-Z gene that encodes for beta-galactosidase. That's the one that actually splits the glucose from the galactose and makes your lactose um, now usable by the bacteria since it's split into its monomers. We've got the LAC-Y gene. Uh, it's the permease gene. That's what helps the lactose actually enter the cell. A little tiny bit gets in, but the cell would want to have uh, more channels for it to come in if it's prevalent. And then finally, the LAC-A codes for this transacetylase enzyme that helps break down toxic byproducts of the digestion process. And so you need the three of these genes present in order to use your um, any lactose that's hanging out outside your E. coli cell. So let's go through the dioxic curve here of um, when we have the different sugars available. Okay, So in the beginning, when glucose is available, we're going to use that right up. You don't need to bother transcribing your lac operon because you've got an easy um, source of carbohydrates. Okay. Then when you run out of glucose, you're going to turn on your lac operon so that you can start making use of all that great lactose that's in your environment there. And then finally, when you've used up all the lactose, it's a good idea to turn off your operons so you're not making enzymes for something that's not there. Okay, so first we've got a repressor protein for the lac operon. And so the repressor binds to the operator sequence. Okay, in the first phase when glucose is present and lactose is present, uh, the repressor doesn't bind. Okay, but there's nothing really boosting um, the opera and transcription. So it's there at low levels, like eh, maybe there's some lactose, we'll use it. Okay. The next phase when glucose is exhausted and you have lactose present, you have this catabolite 
um, activating protein, okay, which binds to that CAP site. Okay, that helps the RNA polymerase transcribe a lot of this particular transcript. Uh, again, the repressor can't bind when lactose is present, and you get the operon transcribed at high levels, okay, because you've got the CAP coming in there and boosting it as an activator. Okay, and then the second stage, when lactose is exhausted, the cap is still there, but the repressor, now that lactose is gone, can now bind and completely shut off the operon because if there's um, no glucose and no lactose, you definitely don't need these genes being transcribed. So the way the LAC repressor works is, again, it's binding to that operator sequence. The repressor turns off or inhibits. If lactose is absent, okay, there is, it binds. Okay. Uh, lactose is not utilized, it's not there. Once lactose shows up, okay, there's this uh, configuration of lactose called allolactose, and it's present whenever lactose is present. And so if there's any of that around, it binds to the repressor, and now the repressor can't touch the transcript. Okay, um, And so this you could almost say this is induced. Okay, This is inducible because when lactose is present, it's inducing off that receptor, and now RNA polymerase can transcribe that operon. Okay? So where the repressor was exerting negative control over the operon. We also have this catabolite activating protein that's exerting positive control over the operon in different modes. Okay, so in the absence of glucose and the presence of lactose, now CAP will exert positive control by really upregulating the production of the um, lactose digestion enzymes. Okay, uh, so for max transcription, the repressor has to be pulled off in a way and bound by lactose, and then CAP has to bind to the CAP binding site. So in order to bind to the promoter, CAP has to be bound to cyclic adenosine monophosphate CAMP, which is really kind of the broken down version of ATP. Okay, And ATP, uh, here, remember our energy currency here, there's an enzyme called adenyl cyclase that converts it to this cyclic AMP form. Okay. And then when that's bound to CAP, that can actually go and, and uh, work on the, on the promoter. However, if there is glucose around, glucose blocks this reaction. So this isn't going to take place until all the glucose in the surrounding environment has been used up. Okay? So don't bother making your lactose degradation enzymes until you have eaten all of your glucose. So here's the cap samp and um, uh, glucose pathway here. So we've got uh, annual cyclase is the enzyme that makes cyclic AMP down from ATP. Glucose blocks that activity, so while glucose is high, no cap is made, and there's like a low level of op around lack of operon transcription, but not a ton. Okay, if there's no CMP available, then cap can't bind. But when glucose is absent, now adenyl cyclase can make the cyclic AMP. That cyclic AMP can bind to the catabolite activating protein that binds to the uh, promoter and heavily recruits RNA polymerase to make more of the um, lactose uh, digestion enzymes and the high level of transcription of the lac operon. Okay. So once CAMP, CAMP cyclic AMP interacts with the CAP, allows CAP by the promoter, and now you get transcription. So let's take another look at our dioxic growth curve now that we know the different things that are going on here. Uh, at the beginning, you know, we've got lots of fresh glucose, uh, so there's not a lot of cyclic AMP because adenyl cyclase, cyclase is being inhibited by all the glucose, so there's not a lot of binding of CAP. There's no repression of, of the lactose um, operon because there's still a little lactose around uh, taking, taking the repressor away. Okay. But once we run out of glucose, uh, now the cyclic AMP is being made, and now it can bind to CAP, and now that can sit on the promoter and recruit the RNA polymerase, and you get a high transcription of that. So you want the lac operon being really actively transcribed when lactose is present and is the only sugar. Okay, That's when we get our positive regulation by CAP. And then at the end, now that our, there's no lactose around, um, the, then the repressor uh, is not being grabbed away by the allolactose that binds to the operator and shuts the lac operon right off. So that's where we get our negative regulation or negative control by the repressor. 
The third example your book talks about is this DNA damage SOS response, okay, that's really driven by this repressor called LexA that prevents transcription of DNA damage response genes unless there's actually been DNA damage. Okay, so when there's um, UV exposure, uh, the parts of DNA's uh, strands will split away and this gene or protein called RecA will bind to that single stranded DNA that's floating around there. And once that occurs, that RecA binding, uh, once LexA gets uh, in contact with that or is, is um, through whatever pathway is, is told about this um, combination, it auto cleaves, breaks apart, and now the repressor um, is inactivated. Now RNA polymerase can grab onto the promoter region there and start making those um, DNA damage response genes that either go and repair or excise or whatever needs to be done to fix that particular point of DNA. You need, need to watch the other videos in the playlist because there's a very good one on the LAC operon, a very good one on the tryptophan operon, and a very good one on this particular um, interaction, the, the SOS response. So definitely check those out. Uh, they do a much better job than I do and why reinvent the wheel when somebody's already made an awesome resource. So uh, go check those out and then um, I will move on to the next part of the lecture.